Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. We are here with another Tuesday Talks. I was about to say Talk Tuesday and get in trouble with FIFA, but I remember this time. But then I said it anyways. I'm going to get in trouble with FIFA. I know that's me. It's going to be... Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> One of these days, I guess I'm going to learn. So today, today, I am so pleased to have three amazing people that I met a handful of months ago uh, through a program that we were all part of. And they are just up to like some very, very cool stuff. Um, you know what? I'm going to let them introduce themselves as well as what they're working on. And then we'll get to our talk, which is essentially about taking charge of your own mental well-being. Any one of you guys, go ahead. Sure, I can get us started. Um, hi, everybody. It's um, really nice to be here. Ali and Latifa, thank you so much for, for this opportunity with Mental Health AE. Uh, my name is Hafsa, and I am one of the co-founders of Peer Minded. I overlook program and outreach development. Um, and yeah, I recently graduated from New York University Abu Dhabi, um, where I studied social research and public policy and developed a very keen interest in public health, um, particularly when it comes to disabilities and mental health. And I'm currently researching um, disability policy and programs in, in the UAE. Um, I'll keep it at that. Um, but yeah, let Sarah and Anis introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to thank Ali and Latifa for inviting us to be uh, here today on uh, Mental Health AE's Tuesday Talks. Uh, I think it's a wonderful initiative that sheds light on a lot of different uh, mental health uh, topics and uh, shedding light also on mental health initiatives in the UAE, which I think is really, really amazing. So thank you for that and for your kind words. Um, my name is Sarah Kaabi. I'm also a recent graduate from New York University Abu Dhabi, where I studied uh, economics and I have a minor in music. Um, I've uh, developed my interest in mental health earlier on in, in life, I would say, uh, where I actually wrote my um, application essay on, on mental health um, reforms in, in the UAE and issues that um, uh, people are facing. Um, so I think within that aspect, uh, that's how I got to be a co-founder as well, uh, alongside Hafsa and Anas of Peer Minded Today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anas. And uh, first of all, of course, thank you so much to um, Ali and Latifa for having us. Um, they're doing some absolutely amazing work with Mental Health AE. And it's really wonderful to always be in touch with them and talk to them about different things. Um, my name is Anas, and I'm a senior at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, I have a majoring in computer science. And um, along with Hafsa and Sara, I'm one of the co-founders of Peer Minded. And currently, I'm working on the technical development um, of our company. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Um, tell me a little bit about the story behind Pure Minded. I'm going to start with what got you guys together on this amazing project. And that's also how I got to meet you guys. So I think let's start there and then we'll, we'll wiggle our way around. Sure. Um, I can answer that question. Um, I actually had the idea for, for this uh, project uh, I would say uh, a little uh, bit before we applied for the MAN incubator, uh, I was having a conversation with a few um, under uh, college, uh, university undergraduate students from AUS and the other universities across the UAE, where we were talking about you know issues that we were facing as university students um, uh, within the mental health topic. A lot of us talked about um, not being access, uh, not being able to access uh, mental health uh, counselors due to a kind of overbooking issues, uh, amongst other problems that we saw uh, arising. Um, we were also talking about uh, the alarming rates uh, of, that students are developing mental health um, disorders uh, at uh, when it, uh, within their academic experience because of different things like social pressures and social expectations and academic expectations as well and having to balance out so much um, during a very uh, difficult uh, transitional phase in, in our lives. Um, so the idea came about there. We were inspired by a student support group um, at uh, New York University of Abu Dhabi. And I remember just opening up the conversation with Hafsa and telling her about, you know, what if we work on um, a, a a platform that actually uh, equips students with, a, with the knowledge and skill set to be able to help 
other students and facilitate conversations around mental health, much like what we have seen in our university. And she re really loved the idea. And that's how um, we you know, started uh, really discussing the, uh, the idea and building on it. And thankfully we got through with them and social incubator. And I think that's you know, where the idea started building up more and more. Um, I think maybe Hassan Anas can talk more about what our platform does um, and the story behind building on it. Sure, yeah, I think before jumping into that, just to echo what Sarah said, um, a lot of what motivates us is this whole culture of um, peer support and support that we've gotten from our, our friends and classmates and, um, you know, roommates at university. Um, and that has come in different ways. It's not just for mental health or we don't always recognize it to come directly, you know, for our mental health, but sometimes it's just about coursework. Sometimes it's just about, you know, adjusting to college or um, transitioning to a new city. And I think at the core of it, um, that's what drives peer minded, which is, you know, the idea that um, you can find uh, channels of support um, in the people around you. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a scary process of going to a counselor or like going and booking those appointments or getting to a professional. And sometimes, you know, challenges that we face, of course, they can, you know, require medical solutions. Um, but sometimes they can also just be ameliorated earlier on um, if there is a, a you know holistic kind of grassroots support network around you um, so yeah that's sort of the I suppose philosophy behind behind what we're trying to do here um, I'll let Anas jump in maybe and Ali if you have a question or not well I let Anas jump I'm, in I'm actually gonna I'm gonna interrupt you guys because you're gonna jump and tell me your solution not just yet not just yet I want to get there in a minute but before we get to the solution that you guys have come up with and then you know explain how peer mining works for all of us Talk to me a little bit more about um, student wellness, uh, student mental health wellness uh, in that context. You know, I've looked at global data, but that data applies to everybody. What makes students different from the, the regular sample? I think I would say here, uh, if, you, if you look at sort of the stage that we're all in at lives, it comes with a lot of transitions. Um, obviously, transitions are a part of life, no matter what stage you're in. But I think these are the particular so-called formative years, um, where for many of us um, here, at least at NYUAD, we're leaving home, um, you know, we're traveling um, either anywhere between 30 minutes to 30 hours from our home countries or our homes to come to campus um, and interacting with um, different identities, interacting with um, different kinds of people. And all of that change can stimulate a lot of um, anxiety and, and a lot of uh, um, sort of questions around, you know, all these newfound feelings and ideas and viewpoints that you're interacting with. Um, it can be like a, a typical term that all of us use, you know, for describing our college years is that it's a roller coaster, you know, all these ups and downs. Um, and at some point you realize that, you know, it, it might not be a bad idea to talk to other people about it, um, or it might not be a bad idea to sort of seek that external support. Um, but the challenge is depending on, you know, where you come from, that might not come naturally to you. Um, and I can sort of speak for myself, you know, from the kind of culture that I come from, um, or the kind of household that I come from rather, and ob obviously just speaking to my experience, not trying to generalize my, my culture. Uh, but I was, I was not growing up, I was not very sort of uh, encouraged or in an environment where it was very easy to sort of speak up and be like, I need, I, I'm, I'm feeling stressed, I need help for this. Um, so coming here and being exposed to this um, kind of environment, where, which is more open, I think, um, is also um, encouraging, um, but again, difficult to, you know, be vulnerable and to seek that, seek that support. So I, I would say in a nutshell, one of the challenges is all these transitions, which can sometimes be exacerbated depending on where you're coming from and what kind of, um, you know, cultures you're used to. No, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, you know, for, for new listeners that don't know, I actually teach at the American University of Sharjah. And I do see that amongst, you know, students, there is this, you can, you can just feel that there's something off. You can sometimes feel that, you, you know, something's going on. But generally, we kind of just chalk it up to, oh, it's exam stress, or I got a project, or they got a deadline. And it just kind of like, let it be, they'll sort themselves out. 
And it's kind of like similar in concept of how you guys started, uh, Latifa and myself last summer, literally out of a discussion about, you know, her, one of her friends needing some mental health support and we weren't able to find something. And then all of a sudden, we started with our, our startup, literally based out of the need of we couldn't find the information and resources. But, you know, along that journey, and I wanted to ping this uh, uh, back to you guys, I was actually surprised to look at the data um, that was available, not here, it was available outside. And then I was even more surprised that there was no data available here. And I could find absolutely nothing when it came to specifically university student data. Uh, and even what I was able to find was very scattered. But the data I found, and there was a particular report um, that I was looking at out of the UK, and they've been running this every year for the last couple of years. There was a huge difference in almost everything when it came to students and the average population. The numbers were higher for anxiety. The numbers were higher for depression. The numbers were higher for all of those sort of things. Would it be fair to make an assumption that those numbers would you know, reflect to our community here also? Um, I personally definitely think so. I think uh, just thinking about student life and the transitional phase that they go through when they uh, enter university and enter uh, at their undergrad, you know, there are so many big decisions that they're asked to make and they're usually around 18, 19 years old. And it's the first time that they really, you know, step out of, you know, the, the comfort of their house to live in a very new environment and have to make all these very big decisions that, you know, people tell you will decide the rest of your life um, when it comes to, you know, the, the degree that you decide to pursue or the job that you decide to apply to. And it's like uh, almost um, kind of limiting your pathway in the future. And I think that creates a lot of anxiety. Um, the moving out of the household setting also creates a lot of uh, feelings like anxiety and perhaps uh, uh, also thinking about like peer pressure. You know, you're looking at other people who are, are your age. Um, am I doing enough? Am I not doing enough? Um, you know, this person is doing like, X amount of extracurriculars, uh, I should be as well. Um, but you know, different people have different um, uh, kind of time commitments and different uh, responsibilities on their shoulders and uh, different capabilities as well, uh, emotional and and uh, emotional uh, capabilities as well. And not everyone can, you know, at the end of the day, like balance a thousand things all at once. Um, but it, it gets really difficult for students when they see other people doing a thousand things all, all at once and um, challenging these notions um, that society has. And I think within the UAE specifically, there is a huge leap uh, that a lot of students have to, to go through and they have to think about a lot of social expectations amongst uh, and balancing out, you know, family with, with um, academics and it's, it becomes really intense. Uh, and I think from my experience, um, it's, it's been uh, very hard, you know, there's always the I versus we, um, and there's always, you know, we're moving towards more of an individualistic, I would say, community or culture, which is, um, I, I think, not taken very lightly by society, because at the end of the day, right now, we are living in a collectivist society, and it becomes difficult to want to prioritize your academics and yourself um, and, you know, move out and like study abroad and, and those things. Um, I certainly did have my own challenges when it came to challenge, uh, when, when it came to wanting to study abroad and moving away from my family setting and pursuing my academics. Um, and it was taken by some people like, oh, but you're leaving your family responsibilities and you're, you're running away from family. But it, wasn't that, uh, you know, and I think a lot of, uh, it's not just specific to the UAE context for sure. Um, I, I'm, I, I've met so many people uh, during my time in university that also spoke of the same issues. Um, so I think it's, it's moving away from the family sort of household to really starting your own life that builds a lot of uh, these negative emotions that could develop into mental health conditions. Um, um, sometimes even long-term mental health conditions. Um, so it does become a huge problem for a lot of university students. In, in the last year, I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of people you know, surrounding this topic. And you know, a, lot of, a lot of discussions and themes seem to be similar and, and very repetitive across a, a lot of different people that I've spoken to. Uh, and, you know, you brought up one of the things, and this is about our society and our family and our culture. 
you know, and this, I'm not saying UAE, I'm saying this part of the world, a big chunk of the world where we are, this region actually, there is still a lot of stigma surrounding having that type of discussion. There's, there's, there's the, uh, you know, and somebody was mentioning the chat, you know, be tough, get it together, keep it together. What's the problem? If that person can do it, you can do it type of. So there's that kind of like, I'm going to say toxic enforcement. It's not really quality reinforcement. It's a very toxic type of reinforcement. But do you feel that there is a shift happening uh, amongst, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm the wrong person to speak to this. Uh, you know, you guys are the generation at the moment who are in college, who are experiencing life. Do you feel there's a shift happening in that? Or, or are we at the beginning of it? Or we still got to kind of, you know, kick some doors down to make it happen? When I think about sort of, uh, I mean, obviously it's hard to uh, generalize this. I can speak from a UAE context because that's the one that we're most familiar with. Um, I've only been here for four years, that is true. Uh, but I think what I've noticed in my time here um, when it comes to the shift in the mental health landscape is one that I can compare to the shift in the disability landscape. Um, and I say that because both of them have sort of had this uh, combination of grassroots uh, movement, but also top-down executive decision making, which has sort of supported that grassroots, you know, that rise in grassroots initiatives and movements and um, things similar to what we're doing. Um, and so on one hand, we have disabilities where, um, you know, there was legislation that um, kind of started way back in 2007, then obviously we signed on to the UN, um, uh, 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 I'm forgetting the exact name, but like the, not the treaty, <laughs> wow, I did my thesis on this, I can't believe I'm blanking, <laughs> um, uh, Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Um, and then, of course, there was national legislation in the UAE, um, Special Olympics World Games, MENA Games happened and the World Games happened. Um, and I think it's important to recognize these big um, sort of high level events for what they are, which is sort of telling people very publicly that it is OK to be talking about these things. It is OK to be having these conversations. Um, and I think that does a lot to create visibility around these issues. I think it's similar for, for mental health, where um, we found sort of, you know, executive government support um, for um, good provision for mental health um, in the UAE and we see it in various government agendas. We see it in the way MON created an incubator around mental health um, in its very first year. I mean, it was just a second incubator, uh, but that kind of goes to show that, you know, there is support for this kind of stuff. Um, and that sort of encourages people who are um, advocating in their communities um, on the grassroots level um, and gives them that platform and that visibility. That to me is a clear indicator that yes, there is a shift that is happening um, and that you know we are putting sort of um, um, funds mm -hmm. towards these um, larger social um, uh, you know, changes that we want to create. Um, and I think that is one way, it is not the only way, but I think that is one of the major ways in which um, the mental health landscape in the country um, is changing even as we speak. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I've, been, I've been in the country a little bit longer than you. I've been here 20 years. <laughs> so I, I got to see a lot of it being built, which is honestly amazing. I got to see a lot of policies on so many things being created, developed, applied, sometimes with a hammer. We're doing this. We're doing this. Let's go. Which I really, I got to say, I appreciate about how things move here. They move. When they move, they move fast. But I've always seen that there's a little bit of like a push to get them to move. Um, you know, I love how, uh, you know, in the UE, we refer to, we, we use the reference people of determination. The, the first time that was announced and I read it, I was like, man, this is so cool. This is so cool. Look at these guys doing things right. Um, I really appreciate that. And I'm, and I'm now feeling, yes, I agree with you. I think there is a shift happening. I'm wondering, pre-COVID, was the momentum there or did COVID kind of like, fuel to the fire and let's get this to the front lines faster. Do you feel that there was a, a boost because of it? Um, I think speaking from my experience, um, I've known some people, uh, I think people my age who are 
uh, really interested in working on uh, uh, mental health advocation. And I met them through uh, platforms like Sale Publishing, amongst other uh, platforms as well. And I think even during my time in university, it was something that was very much talked about uh, pre pre pandemic. Um, so I think in terms of momentum, I, I do think that it was starting before uh, the pandemic came about. But I do think the pandemic has placed uh, uh, a very um, new importance and shed new light on, the, on mental health in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, I'm, I'm seeing people becoming way more empathetic with uh, uh, professors being way more empathetic with their students. I'm seeing uh, a lot of change in, in the way that people interact with one another. Um, and I think um, given the alarming rates of uh, you know, suicide over the past few months uh, relative to you know, the past few years, it's, it's very crazy. Uh, the emotional uh, duress that people are put under just because of this pandemic. Uh, and I think it is forcing people to reconsider the ways they are treating one another, whether they're on a higher level and, you know, and the work uh, force or whether they're just peers. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful to see that change and that acceleration and, 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 and the momentum. Um, but I do think that it was something that was starting. And I think because of the acceleration and the pandemic, um, you know, Matt and Abu Dhabi probably thought of the topic of mental health as one of its incubation topics, which I think is really, really fascinating. I never thought, uh, you know, that um, we would see this change this soon. Uh, to me, it was something that was relatively new, you know, when I was growing up and I didn't really have a good understanding of what mental health was until I would say five, six years ago. Um, so it's really fascinating seeing how great of a momentum the UAE is pushing for um, destigmatizing mental health. And uh, you can see that reflected in the number of initiatives right now that are really popping up that talk about this topic. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, just to sort of echo um, Sarah's sentiments, um, the social distancing that has resulted from um, the entire uh, COVID pandemic didn't actually need to be social distancing. It, it was always meant to be physical distancing. And unfortunately, it ended up being social distancing, which is which is sort of um, aggravating um, the sort of mental health issues that exist in our communities. And so while momentum was already there um, throughout, uh, throughout our communities to sort of push towards mental health, I do feel like um, it has, the, the, the pandemic has sort of, um, given um, an extra push to it in a way. And so um, uh, we see that um, the studies are coming out that say um, that people are sort of feeling more negative emotions that they would otherwise because of the social distancing. But then again, we're also seeing reports that say that um, governments and are taking more proactive steps to prevent that from happening. And so um, as we reminded, what we're really hoping for is that this momentum is sort of carried throughout in the future as well. When people realize that the, uh, the sort of not just human contact, but the right sort of human contact is really important for the mental well-being of, of, of us. And so that's something that needs to be talked about. And that's something that needs to be developed. Anas, uh, right on, man. 100% agree with you on that. I, for me, I think that if I look back at the last six odd months, the biggest takeaway for me has really been the dialogue has started. You know, people are now actively discussing a multitude of things within this, you know, the umbrella of mental wellness and, and mental health. And I think that dialogue is important because that's where you get ideas coming out of. You know, Sada had a, ch a chat with Hafsa and now you guys had your project. Latifa had a chat with me and now we rolled out our project. And, and, you know, similarly, these same stories I'm hearing, you know, from a lot of different people, I think that dialogue makes a difference. And through that dialogue is how we've kind of, you know, reached the ears of the people who are in, you know, decision making and authority and power, especially in government. We've got a, a mental health support line in the country now. Um, and, you know, there's another one that was out of Dubai, uh, healthcare city, another support line that's out of, you know, so we have two basically now in the country that are reasonably active and functional. And a lot of government initiatives that we're seeing in and around these sort of things too. Um, I want to kind of bring it back. We know, we know already, in, you know, from our discussion that we've had so far, we know that the the university 
uh, in the college student bracket that, you know, that 18 to 22, that's a tough spot. It is, it is. And the global numbers speak to it. Uh, and, and, you know, I think if anything, for us being in this part of the world and the stigma associated with talking about it, just, just multiplies it. Um, talk to me about what you guys have come up with. Tell me, how does Pure Minded work? Right. Um, so just to sort of um, go off of that, um, at the core of Peer Mind is the idea of relatability. And that starts with the idea that we're all college students. And so more so than just statistics, more so than just numbers or papers that you see online, um, we know from our experience and we know from people talking about it that um, the, the issues that we're trying to alleviate aren't just issues faced by a small population. We know from firsthand experience that not only do these issues exist in large numbers, but also people really do want ways of alleviating them. And so that's where your mind it comes in. And at the core of it, um, the idea is that sometimes you just don't need um, like a counselor at that exact moment. Sometimes all you need is a person who's willing to listen and who's um, able enough to talk to you at that point. And so that's uh, the core idea of being minded. And I'd like um, Sarah and Hafsa talk more about that. Okay, I can go. Um, so the what we're trying to do with the platform is um, we, we say that we're trying to create um, a holistic sort of ecosystem. And what that really means is we want to make sure that students are not just um, trained in all the necessary comp uh, competencies and facilitation techniques to have conversations with other students who might be struggling. But we also want to make sure that all of that goes somewhere bigger. Um, and by that, we mean we want to sort of um, take information, anonymized, of course, that is, um, you know, presented in these conversations and feed it right back into the universities that these students come from um, so that they can sort of, you know, tackle um, these larger um, sort of community-wide issues um, from their end as well. Um, and there has been a drive, of course, in um, universities across the UAE to sort of, um, you know, do either programming um, or have certain policies to accommodate people when it comes to mental health, um, you know, issues. Um, so what the peer-minded platform, uh, what we intend to do with the peer-minded platform is um, a, to provide a space where students can connect with each other and have these conversations. Um, and then B, provide um, data, provide a space for universities to be able to, you know, share their resources all on kind of one single platform so that their students can access those outside of these sessions. Because at the end of the day, the sessions that we're trying to offer are not a replacement um, to anything more so they're just an additional, you know, um, avenue that you can use to take care of your mental health. Um, and then C, um, sort of providing, you know, larger information on larger trends or data insights um, to universities um, that, like I said, can feed back into, into their programming. So it's, it's almost like a, like a circle in, in, in that regard um, to make sure that um, students are taking care of each other, but are also being taken care of. Um, and I think adding on to Hafsa's point, uh, the concept of peer support and the reason why we decided to adapt, uh, adopt it and, and our model is really the, the amount of resources that we have seen that uh, talk about uh, peer support being uh, a, a great preventative method in alleviating mental health challenges from becoming critical. Um, I'd like uh, I'd like to think of it uh, sort of as an, an, an analogy to teaching someone how to perf perform first aid for uh, you know a serious case or for, for something that could develop into a serious case. Uh, it's like teaching someone and uh, like how to perform uh, first aid uh, in a way that it could prevent the the problem from escalating further. Um, so it's not in any way replacing you know uh, what a doctor can do. It's just helping with with that uh, problem and reducing the risk of uh, the problem that they are struggling with. Um, and uh, the the main problem that we noticed uh, was you know counselors are very much booked for. Um, months on end, um, and this was something that I personally struggled with during my time in, in university. Um, and a lot of people just feel like they need someone to talk to, someone that they can trust, someone that they could really uh, feel like they would understand what they're going through, and you know all all these different things that are uh, accumulating on them. And 
you know, uh, uh, with that, uh, providing a platform that can help facilitate these conversations in a, in a productive way, uh, we feel would, would help with, with this problem and would also equip uh, students uh, to facilitate these conversations with, with their friends and with their families uh, as a ripple effect sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, a result. Um, so there's a lot of potential for, for that as well. I think it's very smart how you guys have structured it, you know, and, and every time I talk to you guys, I get new perspectives and new ideas. Uh, just to recap, you know, just to make sure I've understood it and the listeners are also understanding it. So essentially, you guys have a peer to peer platform where you have, you know, university college students who could kind of like click in whatever the interface is, and they'll be able to chat or talk to somebody who is not not a, like a psychologist or therapist, but who's also basically another student who's going, you know, through the same similar life experiences, let's say, but they've, they've done some training. If, if, is that correct? Is my uh, understanding? So yes. Okay. So they've done some sort of training, but they're not, of course, experts. So it's kind of like more, like you said, mental health first aid type of stuff. You know, they're, they, they're there to talk to you. And then if, if it's something more serious, then they're in the position to tell you, Hey, it, you need to speak to a professional. This needs to be escalated, but you know, it's, it's, the reason I love this model, I'm going to be straight up honest with you, is a lot of people don't understand that mental health is a continuum. It's not a, you know, you, you're okay, you're crazy. It's, it doesn't work that way. And, oh, you're having a problem, you must be crazy. No, it's not that. It's, you know, like you say, oh, I'm just having like a bad day, you know, or there's something serious, you know, or they're like, man, I've had a bad day for too many days in a row. So, you know, if you look at it as a spectrum, as a continuum, you realize that a lot of people are on the, you know, the green side and they're just kind of touching into the, the, the yellows and the oranges and some are getting into the red and not everybody needs to immediately go and, you know, jump to treatment options and medication or whatever. A lot of it just starts with having a conversation, you know, and having somebody to talk to. Every Wednesday we have wellness circle and it literally came out of people asking us, Hey man, we just want a place to talk. And for me, I was like, talk to your friends, man. What do you mean place to talk? But out of conversation, I realized that they're not comfortable talking about these topics. They want to come to a place where they know that it's okay to talk about these topics. So it's, it's preset as a safe space. So I love how you guys are essentially creating these little safe spaces for students to talk to peers who have a little bit of training, a little bit of understanding of what's going on, who could provide the support that they need in that moment. And, you know, like you said, uh, way more readily accessible than, for example, the counselors. And I know uh, all, every university is either does not have them or has too few of them. That's legit for sure. I mean, we've got three for 6,000 faculty, staff, and students. So that's just numbers are wrong. Um, talk to me a little bit about where you guys are on your timeline. Are we uh, ready to access, about to access? And if you're a university administrator listening in, how can we get you to get onto the platform? Well, before we do that, I think just one quick comment that I wanted to make on um, your sort of, uh, you know, notion of the continuum that mental health is sort of um, spread across. And I think from personal experience, you know, being in the yellow zone or slightly darker yellow zone and not necessarily being in that red zone can sometimes also elicit this feeling of guilt if you try to approach those resources which are already so so scarce in nature because you always think well what if somebody needs it more than I do um, you know and it's we already know that these appointments are so hard to get maybe I should just leave that slot for somebody who is in more critical need of this and I think that is the exact population that we're targeting uh, we're not we're not necessarily targeting people who have critical conditions that absolutely need that kind of professional support or even medication, uh, but people who you know are in that yellow zone and they just need somebody to talk to who can relate and who can sort of facilitate a good conversation and then they'll go back to being in the green zone and then maybe the next day they're in the yellow zone again and who knows we'll see but like it's 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 those people and kind of normalizing taking care of your health you know even when you're in that zone and prevent it from getting to that critical critical red zone um yeah i just i just wanted to jump in and say that and i'll, I'll leave sort of sarah and us to talk about the timeline Right. 
Um, I think uh, in terms of our timeline, we're hoping to launch our pl platform uh, towards the beginning of 2021. Um, hopefully, once we uh, once we get uh, the proper you know interest, uh, we'll be able to uh, address that. Um, uh, we're currently uh, recruiting our. We're actually looking into uh, recruiting our very first intern, which is uh, very exciting, and we're really looking forward to it. Um, and we're hoping to start uh, marketing what we're doing and uh, what our platform does within the next few months and really just shedding light on our initiative and um, what we hope to do and, you know, do more of these talks, uh, I would say, with, with uh, more uh, uh, startups that deal with uh, shedding light on mental health um, as well. Uh, so I would say beginning of 2021, hopefully we'll we'll be launching our platform. Maybe Anas can talk more about that. Yeah, uh, so just to quickly add to that. Um, so the, the final platform, we envision it to launch in January 21. Um, however, um, we do in the next um, in the next few months, we do plan on what launching sort of a beta version, which would not necessarily have all the bells and whistles of the final finished product, but it would sort of give us a more uh, in-depth um, insight into what exactly needs to be on the platform itself. And so we're doing this in conjunction with market research and surveys with universities as well, because of course, um, what we're trying to do with the platform is to take a three-pronged approach. Not only do we intend to help the people who are being talked to, not only do we intend to educate the general um, student body by uh, recruiting peer supporters and giving them these curriculum uh, trainings. We also intend to be able to provide universities with the information they need to be able to provide better services. Like how would a university know which areas or what, which topics they need to prioritize if they, um, if they have like no overall information or no general trend of what's going on. Of course, um, and under no circumstances would we think about um, sort of being more granular, but as a whole, um, we intend to be able to communicate with universities and help them make their services better as well. And as you led me to a very interesting point, and I was, I was thinking about this a little earlier. Um, for universities who don't have something set up, for universities who, uh, I could name names, but I'll, I'll be nice, <laughs> who, who don't, who are not bothered to look at it. They're like, if we don't look at it, the problem doesn't exist. Let's just keep looking over here, right? Uh, what sort of framework, system, regulations, policies, you know, what, what, can, what can we give the universe and say, hey, this is how you should do it, you know? And then you guys are just a plug-in on top of what they should already have. They should have a something. So what, guys, tell me a little bit about what do you recommend for universities at the bare minimum should have in terms of some sort of infrastructure that is catering to and or looking at mental wellness. And, you know, of course, specifically in the terms of uh, the student body. Um, that's a that's a very tough question. And I think you know that, <laughs> which is which is also why you uh, brought it to the fore. Um, I think before sort of coming in with any kind of, um, you know, recommendations or solutions or ideas on frameworks that can be implemented. I think at the very basic level, what needs to be done is inculcating a culture of having conversations about these things and having sort of prioritizing student well-being in your overall, you know, university operations or agendas. Um, I think, I think that's, Gather, like gaining, uh, sorry, um, instituting consciousness around around the fact that you know student well being is actually something that we need to be thinking about, and actually something that we need to be sort of putting into our agendas is is where it begins. Um, whether we as peer minded can do that, that's that's a bit questionable. Uh, but overall, I think my recommendation would be um, from my experience as a student, of course, not not coming in from like a high level administrative perspective. But as a student, I would sort of want, if my university is, it does not already have programming and infrastructure in place, um, I would sort of want them to uh, start having conversations and asking me about what it means for me to, you know, be functioning at my fullest, uh, being mentally, you know, at my 100%. Um, and understanding sort of what my grievances are and what my needs are. 
um, before working on, um, you know, a university specific uh, solution to that. I don't think the answer is just putting three counselors in your school without necessarily creating, you know, an environment where people would actually be going out and seeking those counselors without creating an environment where you're encouraging students to seek those resources. Um, so the first step I would say would be to inculcate that consciousness, which is a very hard first step to take, don't get me wrong. Um, but if there's no consciousness, your infrastructure and your solutions won't really do any good. Then you're just sort of, you know, putting a check mark against some metrics that you're trying to evaluate yourself against, but they don't go deeper than that. I think that's very well said. And you kind of, you know, hit, hit the nail on the head, rightfully so. A lot of places are just doing it to put that little tick mark and say, yeah, we got this. And, you know, we got this. And there's real no measure. Um, and I can give you an example myself. Uh, when I got into this, you know, the whole mental uh, health thing, and, and I asked my students, I'm like, guys, uh, we have counselors on campus. How many of you know about it? And out of a class of 25, on average, two students raised their hand. And I asked this question four sections across two semesters. So that's 200 students I asked. And the answer on average was two out of 25. And the other ones were like, what? We have counselors? And I was like, oh my God. So I think the dialogue, and we were talking about the dialogue earlier, I'm gonna bring it back again. I think that dialogue needs to be started at the students. And, and you know, I think if we take it, and I agree with you, if we directly go to administration, they'll just take a box. But if we start that conversation in the student body and it kind of organically goes and say, hey, we want a place where we can sit and have a chat about these things. Hey, we want to have resources that can help us with these sort of things. Hey, you know, we want to have a discussion about uh, how you guys, and I'm pointing at me and the administrators now, don't organize yourselves enough and give us 20 exams in one week and then nothing the three weeks after. Why can't you spread them out? I mean, do some math. Come on. I think it's very right to start that conversation at the student level. I think because of COVID, we got that boost and everybody's talking about it. And, and you know, uh, you young guys are in it and have started that dialogue. And it's kind of like, it's, it's becoming very viral in how this conversation is happening in a lot of places and in a lot of different student circles. So I think that's a fantastic, fantastic point to start. And, and hopefully we can push the administration of you know, all these multitude of universities and say, look, we've got solutions for you. You just need to kind of get on board with the idea. And I think then it's gonna be, you know, the upward slope becomes the downward slope and then things become easier. Uh, guys, oh, uh, I'm over. Sorry. Ooh. No, no, go oh, ahead, yeah. go ahead. I just wanted to quickly jump in and make a very quick acknowledgement, um, if I guess you could call it that, which is that um, oftentimes I've seen, you know, um, students are students are so passionate about collecting and organizing and, you know, all these grassroots movements um, across various sectors of life. But I guess it's also important to just acknowledge sometimes how draining that can be and how much that can how much energy that can take away from you to keep having these mm -hmm. conversations over and over and over again against what seems like a block of you know concrete. Um, and so mm -hmm. that should not stop anyone from doing that. And if you're a student at a university or you want to create this kind of change, I think you should absolutely go for it. But I think there's no um, no one should ever feel guilty to take out time away from that advocacy and take care of themselves. Um, and take the space that mm -hmm. they need um, just because so much energy can be spent. And mm -hmm. while I don't have experience advocating to this level for mental health in my university, there are other areas where I have advocated as a student um, to the administrators um, who have been so resistant for better or for mm -hmm. worse to that kind of change. Um, and so that I've, yeah, so it's just, just to say that take care of yourselves before you advocate. Yep for the university to take care of everybody. Uh, I, I back you on that 100%, you're right. You yourself are the first priority. You can't burn yourself out to do something else as an initiative, I agree with you. And every, you know, every time I talk to students, you know, and they're complaining about something and I, and I quietly, patiently listen to the complaint. I'm like, okay, what's, what's the issue? What's the trouble? What's the drama going on? Oh, sir, this is happening. Oh, sir, that's happening. Uh, and I'm like, okay, what have you done about it? Oh, I didn't do anything. Why not? Because nothing's going to happen. I'm like, with that attitude, nothing ever will happen. But I'm just one person. And I said, look, if, you, if my door is closed and you knock on it, I might hear it, I might not hear it. But if two people are knocking on it, if 20 people are knocking on my door, 
If 200 people are knocking on my door, that door is coming down, whether I like it or not. So, and, and, I'm, and, and, I, and I always tell my students, you guys not only have the power, you just don't realize that you don't have the power. You have the power, you have the numbers, and my goodness, you have social networking. <laughs> I didn't have that when I, was, when I was young. You know, you have the power of the internet. So there's a lot you can do. There's a lot you can do. Uh, sorry, you want to talk about something. Yes. Uh, so I think when it comes to mental health, you know, just having general dinner table conversations with, with your family, like I think that can also make a very big difference. And, you know, starting at home is the way to go about it. I, I, I think when, when it comes to really um, wanting to make a change, um, whether you prefer to do that, you know, starting at the dinner table or uh, looking into other uh platforms that, that you could advocate on. And as you mentioned, like social media is a very powerful tool Tool nowadays. Like uh, one post can really make a big difference and reposting content that, you know, uh, destigmatizes mental health uh, conditions and um, the uh, abuse of, uh, of words tied to mental health conditions and um, really uh, tearing uh, or taking value away from, um, from the extent of uh, the the issues that people are struggling with, you know, abusing terms like nafsiya and like other terms where you're using um, mental health conditions as a way to uh, kind of make people feel bad and say something negative about them. I think just starting from there can make a very big difference. Um, and I would say that's that's where I started and that's how I sort of developed my interest and I realized you know it made a big difference and in, in my family at least and I noticed uh, within my family dynamics because I was able to start these conversations that um, I opened the door for for my sisters to be able to you know openly talk about how they talk about uh, their struggles with depression and, and anxiety throughout their um, high school experience. Uh, so I do think that there are ways and with social media, it opens so many doors for us. Um, and there, I think when it comes to universities uh, trying to implement change for, for students, there are two ways to go about it. I think there's the student population who are struggling with mental health um, and in targeting that, um, I, I do believe that they should be given the, ac the required academic accommodations to help them you know, uh, be on an equal footing to, to other students. And as for the students who are uh, going or might develop you know, mental health conditions because of the aggressive academic requirements and uh, assignments. And as you said, like the exam seasons and uh, all this pressure, they should look into really uh, ways uh, to alleviate that through perhaps uh, um, instead of stacking everything in, in one week uh, to uh, perhaps uh, uh, spreading, it, spread, spreading it out uh, evenly throughout a semester or a year. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. And I think just having a conversation is where everything starts at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, whether it's at a dinner table or with uh, university leadership, uh, and I, I, think, I think that's the main instigator for change. Well, I agree with you. And I've had, you know, discussions at my dinner table with my kids. And, and you know, since last year, it's become very normal in our household to, to talk about stuff. And, and to the point now that my kids make fun of me, you know, if I'll be sitting and I'm working and I've been quiet for an hour because I'm kind of like in my zone, you know, my daughter will walk past Baba. Are you OK? I'm like, yeah, I'm OK. Why? It's OK if you want to talk. I'm like, OK, if I want to talk, I'll let you know. But you know what? There's a very nice website, mentalhealth.ae. You can go to it. <laughs> so my kids are telling my own website to me. I'm like, thank you. You can leave now. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's so different when you're able to have that conversation, like you said, at your family dinner table. And then it just normalizes and so, so much more faster than you would think. You would think, oh, man, this is going like, to take forever. A handful of conversations in, and now all of a sudden, oh, well, okay, we're all talking about it. We're all talking about it. It's all good, man. It's all good. We can talk about things. I think, I think that's very rightfully said. It starts with that conversation. Starting with family is great. And, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, Latifa and myself for our project have also targeted this segment, the 18 to 22, 
because as young college students, you're in a position to understand things and talk to your parents about them. And at the same time, you can be the champion for your younger siblings who aren't able to articulate or might not you know, find themselves brave enough to bring this discussion forward. Or even if they are, the, the parents might not take them seriously. They're like, oh, you're just a kid. What do you know about feeling depressed or whatever the case is? Uh, guys, we are like about seven, eight minutes away from Time's Up. So if you got questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, Latifah, I know, has been monitoring both. I've been keeping my eye on uh, both the Instagram Live as well as the Zoom. So if you guys got any questions, uh, just, just drop them in. And, and, I'll, and I'll feed them to the speakers. If you have something specific, you can ask by name also. Um, while we're waiting for that to happen, uh, have you guys graduated yet or about to graduate? What's going on? Where's everybody at? That's for us, right? Or Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Um, got confused for a second. Yes, um, I graduated in May. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Congratulations. Yes. Also, Sara Anas? Um, I haven't. Um... I'm going to graduate this May. Does this May? Okay, almost there. So, uh, so I take it we didn't have graduation ceremonies, right? Because of COVID. So everyone's going to postpone. No problem. We will show up as uninvited guests shamelessly. No problem. We we'll say, "How are we doing?" <laughs> All right. This has been fantastic. Fantastic. Let me just look. Any other questions? Uh, Latifa, did you did I miss any questions? Because I've been trying to skim through while I've been talking. Um. I don't seem to have anything on Instagram. And I think you guys have been doing a great job answering the questions in the, in the Zoom chat. As yeah, is. we've been active. We've been active. <laughs> uh, but I guess one thing that I could say is that um, we're looking to launch our MVP soon. And Anas described earlier what it's like. But you can mm -hmm. sort of um, keep an eye out on our socials and on our website. Um, and if you're a university student, you are more than welcome to kind of jump in, sign up for a session and try out for yourself what Queer Mind is all about. Oh, well, that's gonna be fantastic. And we will definitely be reposting and please give me your little plug-in. How can people find you? Um, I will, we will drop those in the chat as well. Okay. No, 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 uh, not I just think... the chat, we're recorded, so tell me. Okay. Go for it, Sarah. I can also add uh, that we're uh, looking to open new internship positions for students Excellent. who are interested in, in helping out with, with peer minded. So we'll keep an eye out on our Instagram and our website uh, for updates. Which is? I'm putting it down right now. It's peer minded. No, at peer minded. At um, peer minded. Peer minded dot com. Peer slash minded dot com. Okay, peer dash minded dot com. Fantastic. That's the website. And at peer minded, one word, no space uh, for the Instagram, correct? Yes. Okay, that's fantastic. All right, guys, last chance. Any questions? Um, oh, yeah. I think I saw one earlier from Budur, if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. that right. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. The question was how do you guys were coping with stress during study at university and any tips that you can share? Um, that's a big one. And I think I'll kind of keep it short. I know we're running out of time, but I think one thing to acknowledge here is that nobody always gets it right. Um, and it's, it, it takes so many trials and errors to figure out what works for you and what does not. Um, and I think for me, what worked was funnily enough, scheduling in sessions with my friends where we would just kind of go and, um, grab some karak or have, you know, um, mm -hmm. just a walk around campus or, um, just get try and get off campus to grab some food and it sounds so counterintuitive why would you schedule something why would you schedule time for fun um, I'm not recommending it I'm just saying it worked out for me because otherwise I would just get so lost in my work and what I was trying to do that I would forget to take out time for myself um, and yeah, that, that, that worked out for me. But the bottom line is um, being intentional in terms of finding time to spend with your friends or alone if, you know, that's what you prefer. But intentionality in terms of, you know, taking care of your, yourself matters because it, let's be honest, in university, it doesn't come naturally. It won't just happen once you're done with this assignment because another will pop up and then another and then there's a quiz and a presentation before you know it. It's your, you know, senior year and it's it's time to, but yeah, to be intentional. No, I'm, I'm actually going to take a step and tell uh, and say that Hafsa is not only right, you need to schedule and you need to schedule time with your friends. You need to schedule time for you separately to do an activity that's not study related. Because you, once you get in the zone, you just you you end up overworking yourself, and you don't realize it till you've already done it. You've already already worked yourself too much. 
So scheduling even a time with friends, you know, whether it's just a drive or a chat, or like you said, going for a cup of karak, it's great. Uh, but do it in the schedule. It works. It, it's, you know, why not use solutions that are tried and tested? Oh, fantastic. All right, guys, uh, any, any uh, last words of wisdom before we wrap up? I would say echoing. I, when, yeah. <laughs> go, go for it, Sarah. You go. Um, I just wanted to echo on Hafsa's words um, and say, you know, it's, it's very important to make time for yourself and really unwind and reflect um, because that really uh, helps with, with, you know, your emotional and uh, mental well-being, I think, in the long run. So definitely do try to uh, give yourself, you know, uh, however much time you think you need on a weekly basis and make sure you uh, check in with yourself how you're feeling um, and I, I think that is something that has really worked for me. Uh, and right now I'm actually starting to develop this new rule for myself, self rule, uh, where I try not to work during the weekends to really give myself enough time to recover and um, you know, be able to work at my, uh, at my best during the week. Uh, this is something that I'm currently experimenting with, maybe something that works for you. Um, uh, but yeah, be intentional, make time for yourself and try to do something that you like to, to help with how you're feeling. Yeah, and to sort of follow up on that, um, do not be afraid to experiment and figure out what it is that really helps you. Um, somebody might recommend something that works for them, but it may not work for you and that's okay. Do not be discouraged. Be intentional in what exactly is that you're hoping to achieve. Um, and do not be discouraged, like I said. Um, and I think with that, um, it's um, it, that's all from our side for now. And uh, thank you so much, um, Ali and Latifa, for having us. It was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And it's always uh, really nice talking to you. So, yeah. Well, this was great, guys. I appreciate having you guys on board, man. Uh, Sarah, just to give you a heads up, what you are trying to do now is what people do 10 years burning into their career and like, oh, my God, where's my weekend? And then they try to learn it. So you're ahead of the curve, 100%. I'm uh, happy Anas, to hear. You, you, I, I literally say that are almost all of our meetings. Not everything works for everybody. Keep trying different things. Uh, you know, my friends sent me to yoga. That didn't work. Me and yoga don't get along. <laughs> but I, I've had, I enjoy meditation. I never thought I would. Meditation works for me. Yoga don't work for me. I'm not flexible like that. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much, guys. It has been absolutely wonderful having you. Uh, quick reminder to everybody listening, tomorrow we've got Wellness Circle, uh, 